Unit 4. The Context of Jeremiah the Prophet. We just got done fin- uh, covering Isaiah, and he is uh, right here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of move down the timeline a little bit from Isaiah, and we're now going to focus at this guy right here, Jeremiah. And just if you look at right where he falls, I mean, he is right up to the very end of Judah and, and even into the Babylonian captivity, although that's mostly covered by uh, Ezekiel and Daniel. But you can see Jeremiah is, is right at the end of Judah. But we do know that he is a contemporary of Daniel and Ezekiel. So the same kind of backdrop of everything that's happening politically uh, is the backdrop of, of these three prophets. But right now, as we look at Jeremiah, we see that he was called as a prophet during the final years of Judah and even in a little bit into the exile itself. So that's kind of where he falls when it comes to the other prophets. How, how does he relate to the kings? What's going on with the leadership of Judah during these final tumultuous years? Because there's a lot to cover and there's a lot of change that happens. So let's see if we can kind of uh, organize and learn what happens during these final years, during the backdrop of Jeremiah's ministry. So so we learn uh, from Jeremiah 1.1, it says, The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilk- Hilkiah, of the priests who were in uh, Anna- Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, um, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah. So here's some context. The son of Ammon, the son of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. There's even a specific year mentioned. But then it goes on in verse 3, and it says, It also came in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, who is another son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. So there's a lot mentioned right in this one verse. And I want to see if we can kind of break it up so we understand what's happening during the ministry of Jeremiah. So here's our timeline. We looked at uh, these specifically, these specific kings are mentioned in that, in that opening of Jeremiah. You've got Josiah, Zedekiah and Jehoiakim. So who are these guys and why do we care? Well, let's see if we can understand what happens politically because this is what is going to help us understand the book of Jeremiah and his ministry and his role. So if we look first at King Josiah, we we just look at the, the, the length of his rule. He ruled for a long time. He's actually kind of connected down with Jehoiakim. We'll see that in a second. But he had a 32 year Uh, rule from 641 to 609. So Josiah, he ruled for a long time. And there were, uh, there, this was due to two things. There's two reasons why Josiah had so long of a rule. The first one was that Josiah instituted a lot of godly reforms in Judah. And the second is that this time was a kind of a lull between Assyria and Babylon's dominance. So you have these two factors. And I don't think these are disconnected at all. I think Josiah's godliness he, God honored that, and he kept away the the enemies there. And you'll notice that as soon as as soon as the his sons, who are not as who are not godly kings, come in, that's when Babylon's uh, power begins to ramp up again, in keeping with the covenants as we've seen. But if we pause here for a second, we kind of zoom back, so we remember that these are the three main sections of the history of Judah: the his, the Israel phase, the Assyria phase, and the Babylon phase. Well, remember Isaiah was right there kind of at the overlap between when Assyria uh, was really coming to power and and Israel was kind of fading out, and because Assyria, of course, overtook northern Israel. But Jeremiah now, he kind of is at a similar spot, but but with, with different empires, because now Jeremiah, he's right at the overlap of kind of when Assyria now is on the decline, and but before Babylon is really the force that it, that it finally becomes. And so Right at the time of Jeremiah, you can, if you kind of just look down, this is kind of a lull between Assyria and Babylon, and you can see Josiah down there, and Jeremiah was kind of the prophet, along with uh, some of the minor prophets there at the same time. So this is the context of, of the beginning of Jeremiah's ministry. Josiah is the king, and he was a godly king, and, so, and there was not a, a big threat of a superpower at that time. But then his sons take 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 over. And so we, Josiah has three sons, and they all got kind of confusing Bible names. So the, his three sons are Jehoaz, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. And then there's another one, a grandson also thrown in the mix, Jehoiachin, and he was the son of Jehoiakim, which we'll get to in a second. But these are the last kings of Judah. So how does this work? So we have Jehoaz was the first king after jo- Josiah, and he only lasted three months. 
And then followed him was his brother, Jehoiakim, who had an 11-year reign. He was followed by his son, Jehoiachin, which was he also had a very short reign. And then you have the final king of Judah, Zedekiah, who also had an 11-year reign similar to Jehoiakim. So now at this time, kind of right as Josiah dies in the year 609, Babylon is a real threat. And this is a crazy year because you have Josiah dying, you have Jehoaz taking the throne for a couple months, and then you have the beginning of the, the rule of Jehoiakim. But another key factor during this time is that there is a competitor to Babylon. Babylon is a main threat, but there's... but. There's also a threat against Babylon, and that is a resurgent power that we haven't talked about for, for, for weeks and weeks and weeks, and that is Egypt. So Egypt now is competing against Babylon for dominance. So now you have this international scene where Babylon's going to come in and overtake Judah, but Egypt is kind of is a threat to Babylon. Now, the reason this matters, we've got a lot of context here. Why does this matter? Well, if we look at 2 Kings 23... Here's what it says. It says, Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, which we just looked at. It says, he, was e- he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, came, uh, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came up, and Jehoiakim became a vassal for three years. So at this point, during Jehoiakim's rule, uh, Israel or Judah had no power, and they were a vassal to Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. So they allowed them to remain, but they didn't have any any power, and they were basically uh, owned by Babylon, but allowed to, to, to be independent. They were a vassal state. But then what happens? Look what it says. Then he turned and rebelled against him. So Jehoiakim turns on Nebuchadnezzar, and then the Lord sent against him raiding bands of Chaldeans, Syrians, Moabites, and the bands of the people of Ammon. So God responds went to this uh, betrayal by sending in the enemies. Now, what's interesting is that um, we, it says here in the next verse, he says, it sent, he sent them to Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servants, the prophets. Now, what's interesting, you're like, well, I thought Nebuchadnezzar was an enemy. Well, at this point, after Josiah, it's the kings of Judah who are the enemy of God. And look how it, look what it says about, about Nebuchadnezzar. Now, we haven't gotten to this yet in Jeremiah. We're still talking about the context. But just to give you some framework, look what Jeremiah 27.6 says about Nebuchadnezzar. He says, And now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. See what it calls him? God calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant. And the beasts of the field I've also given to serve him. We also see the same context in Daniel 1.1. 1, 1. So we'll get to Daniel in the next module, but look at what the very first verse of Daniel says. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. So if we look back at our timeline, we see a lot's going on politically. We see we got these kings, and we've got um, we got the prophet Jeremiah right there in the mix. But what I want to do is actually want to I want to swap out the life of the prophets there with some of the key events that happen at this very end of Judah, because during this little sliver, these few years, so many important things happen. So let's go through this. So we had our first king Josiah. Right, he reigned for a long time. He was followed up by the very short rule of his first son Jehoaz. After that, you have King Jehoiakim, who was who was on the throne eleven years. But if you notice during his reign, if you look right up, a really important event happens, and that is the first deportation of the Jews. So now we're now we're in, at six oh eight B.C. and a lot of stuff goes on here. So let's see if we can kind of walk down the timeline together to understand the context of Jeremiah's ministry. So we have Nebuchadnezzar, so who comes in, and the first thing he does is he deports 10,000 Jews from Judah, and which included Daniel, his friends, and the prophet Ezekiel. So the best, uh, the leadership, the politicians, a lot of the, t- the upper crust of Judah was gone. They took him out and deported him to Babylon. But what's interesting is because of the vassal relationship, he does not take King Jehoiakim. He leaves him, and he spares him. Then, though... After that first group is gone, Jehoiakim turns on Nebuchadnezzar. That's what we just read. He betrays him, and he aligns with the enemy of Babylon, Egypt. Well, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't like this very much, so he then goes to retaliate against Jehoiakim. He returns to kill him, but what happens is that Jehoiakim actually dies in battle before that happens, and he is succeeded shortly by his son, Jehoiachin. 
So now Jehoiachin is the king who's, who's on the throne when Nebuchadnezzar arrives. And so when he gets there, he deports Jehoiachin, but he also deports a large amount of the people of Judah. So at first it's kind of the leadership, and then it's the large majority of the population. But at the same time he deports them, he also places another king on the throne of Judah because they're still a vassal state, despite the fact that Jehoiakim had betrayed him. And then that's how Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, gets placed on the throne. Nebuchadnezzar puts him there under this oath of loyalty that he would be faithful. Well, he is for a while, but again, like his brother, uh, in the ninth year of his reign, Zedekiah also rebels against Nebuchadnezzar and aligns himself with Egypt. And this is what sets up for the full destruction, because Nebuchadnezzar does not like this, of course, and so Nebuchadnezzar ends up um, retaliating against Zedekiah. He, he kills his sons, he plucks his eyes out, um, and then he binds him and he sends him off over to Babylon. And that after that, we have the huge, the, the final act, the destruction of, of Judah. And so here, after Zedekiah betrays him, just as Jehoiakim did, Nebuchadnezzar destroys Jerusalem, he destroys, they raid the temple and the palace, they take everything out, and they utterly wipe out Judah and Jerusalem. And so now the riches of, of the temple are deported over to Babylon, and Judah and Jerusalem are left in ruins. And this is the backdrop of the ministry of Jeremiah. And all I have to say is no wonder he was weeping. Now, that was a lot. We just covered a ton of historical backdrop. So let's pause here and let's go to our next unit. So I want to now look at, now that we understand a little bit of the messy context that Jeremiah uh, is, is called to minister underneath, now I want to look at the book of Jeremiah. So if in our next unit, join me as we look at the structure of the book of Jeremiah.